Would you take your Bibles this morning <clears throat> and let's turn to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 24. As you've noted already, as you've seen, we have given our time today to making much of the resurrection of the Lord. Rightly so. Today is the day that the Christian church is historically set aside for this purpose. This last week, in fact, has been dedicated to remembering the passion of our Lord. From Palm Sunday to Maundy Thursday to Good Friday to Resurrection Sunday, this week is special in so many ways and for so many reasons. This past Friday night, we actually as a church dedicated an hour or so to remembering and looking intently at the cross of our Lord. And we capped that evening off with the Lord's Supper, which was a very fitting memorial to our Lord's finished work on the cross. We need to remember that Paul told us that we proclaim the Lord's death until He comes every time we eat the bread and drink the cup together like that. There's something about the truth of the cross and the truth of the resurrection that is intended by God to loosen the tongues of His people so that we proclaim truth to others. The passage we want to look at this morning can be broken down rather easily into three big sections, and we want to look at those three big sections this morning. First of all, I want you to see the king's resurrection. Secondly, I want, to see, I want you to see the king's instruction. And thirdly, I want you to see the king's commission. We're going to live in this chapter. And I want us to just spend our time together this morning here. So let's begin by considering this first, the king's resurrection, the king's resurrection. What I want to do is I just want to read down through this chapter. It's long. There's 53 verses here. I know that. Uh, but I want to read through it and I want to teach as we go. I want to stop and note things as we go. I want us to, to learn from this text along the way. And so I want to begin reading at verse number one where we read Luke's record of the disciples' discovery of our Lord's resurrection. They discover He is risen. We saw some of these verses at the beginning of the service. We'll return to them now. Beginning at verse 1, let's read. You follow along. I'll read aloud. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. You know, I'm always struck by the painful honesty of the gospel writers. Sometimes it feels almost like brutal honesty as they write. They didn't write what they wrote to make themselves look good. Uh, they didn't write to paint themselves out as the heroes of the story. They, they, they did not make sure they were thought well of. They simply recorded by the Spirit's inspiration the truth of the story, how it actually happened. It's one of the reasons we believe that this book is truly inspired of God, because if men were writing it, we would not write like this. We always want to be the hero of our story. <laughs> we, we always want to be thought well of by those around us. I'm struck here as we read that, that Christ's followers were, it seems, not even anticipating the resurrection. They came on the third day. He talked about the third day. But they came on the third day. And what did they come with? They didn't come with palms to sing praises. They came with spices to anoint a dead body that was going to be smelling. They didn't come anticipating the resurrection. In fact, the, the writer Luke tells us that they were, they were perplexed and, and they were confused by the empty tomb. They found it empty. They went in. They expected to find a body. They didn't find a body. And it confused them. 
In fact, in another gospel we read, one of them reports, so they've taken the body. Where have they taken the body? There was not the anticipation of the resurrection. They weren't quite sure what to make of what they found there. Clearly, from what we read here, they did not on their own remember what Christ had taught them. They weren't trusting. They weren't clinging to the promise that He had made to them. In fact, Luke is clear here that they only remembered His words once the angel reminded them of what He'd said. (laughs) Don't you remember what He taught you? Oh yeah, now we remember. But they didn't on the front end. They didn't in the darkness after Friday. To their credit, though, they did remember his words when they were reminded of them. Oh, how much like us they were. (laughs) How many times do we find ourselves in the middle of trial, in the middle of difficulty, in the middle of discouragement, and we can't even remember the promises of God? It's not even in our minds. We're confused and we're troubled and we're doubting and we're struggling. And then someone comes along and says, don't don't you remember? Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yes. That's true. Keep reading. Verse number nine. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and all the rest. I don't know about you, but I, I, I love the fact that the, that the knee-jerk reaction of these who discovered the resurrection was not to keep it to themselves, was not merely to go back to their own homes rejoicing, was not merely to have their own private praise service, but to go and to tell the others what they had seen. I can't keep this to myself. I've got to tell someone. And they ran, as it were, back to where the others were. Hey, you're not going to believe this. He is alive. They weren't quiet. They weren't selfish. It wasn't about a personal experience of truth. There was more to it than that for them. They went and they told. Sadly, though, the response of those they told, in fact, the 11, the the apostles, the the ones who had been faithful and then at the end kind of ran away in fear, but had cowered the weekend and they'd been told they'd be converted and they'd need to strengthen one another. They'd been warned about all of this. In fact, the end of the Gospel of John is just chapter after chapter of instruction on the final night before the cross to get the disciples ready for this. And these 11, how do they respond to the news that he's alive? Well, not like you would expect. Verse 10, now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And they did not believe them. Can you imagine this? The women had been to the tomb that morning. They had seen that it was empty. They'd wrestled with their own confusion. They'd seen the angels. They'd heard the reassuring words that had been delivered to them. They'd been convinced by the angels that Christ was indeed risen just as He had told them He would. But the apostles refused to believe the report. In fact, there's almost an arrogant, dismissive attitude. It's just women telling tales. It's just gossip. Just leave us alone to it. Let us go on mourning. Just be quiet. Stop talking. 
You're interrupting our sobriety, our serious moments of reflection. It's just talk. You don't know what you're talking about, so be quiet. That's the response of the eleven to the news. He's alive. But to their credit, at least one of the disciples decided, well, I guess it's at least worth checking out. Another gospel writer says there's probably a little more excitement there than we see from the writer Luke. What do we see here? Peter, verse 12, rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. John's gospel tells us that Peter wasn't alone. There were at least two of them who went. John says it this way. So Peter went out with the other disciple. This is how John refers to himself. John, the other disciple. And they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And not stopping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth with which he had, uh, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself. And then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in. He saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the Scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. So let's not be too hard on these, though we read their response and it seems calloused and cold. It's one where they are now gripped with a misunderstanding which led to an unbelief. Again, remember, they're a lot like us. How many things do you and I struggle to believe or struggle to trust or struggle to cling to and it's rooted in our misunderstanding or our misapplication of the very words of the living God? We don't know what He said. We don't understand what He said. Therefore, we don't believe what He said and live in what He said. This is what their problem was. This is often a problem we face as well, friends. They'll miss the fact that they did not believe until they saw things for themselves. The women saw and believed. Now they had to see so that they would believe. And You know, this makes sense if you think about it. They didn't understand the Scriptures, and they're being told something now, and it's starting to come together. It helps us understand Thomas a little better, doesn't it? Again, a little later in John chapter 20, what do we read there? Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, sounds like the other eleven when the women came, right? Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. By the way, the door was locked and Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas said the only thing that one can say in that moment. My Lord and my God. And we can't afford to neglect the fact that Jesus then spoke to Thomas. And he followed up this with what he said in verse 29 of that text. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. 
brothers and sisters. It's talking about us. We are taking God at his word. We haven't seen the risen Christ. But we believe in the risen Christ. You see, everything in this first section of the passage of Luke 24 is written to make the amazingly profound and eternally significant point that King Jesus truly rose from the grave just as He said He would. What He said He would do, He did. And when He rose, it was factual, it was real, it was true. Remember that during His ministry, He stated the truth of His power over life and death plainly. We've seen this before, John chapter 10, for this reason the Father loves me. Because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He is the sovereign over life and death. He stated it differently to Martha. You remember this in John chapter 11, just one chapter later as he spoke to her on the occasion of her own brother's death. And he's interacting with her about who he actually is as the Christ. And he says to Martha, Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? The question is, do you believe? He even taught His sovereignty over death to His disciples repeatedly. Though they did not respond well to His teaching on the subject, just remember this. Mark chapter 8, what did it say? And He began to teach them. This this is the beginning of teaching. He kept teaching them this. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And what did He tell them? And after three days, rise again. And He said this plainly. Like, like there was nothing to be misunderstood here. Like he said it, they, they heard it. He said it repeatedly and they heard it repeatedly. And how did they respond? And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He taught them, and they had actually rejected what he taught them. They didn't want to hear this. That's not what they were expecting. It's not what they wanted. Now, though, our text in Luke 24 is clear that in spite of those who sought his life, in spite of those who plotted his death, in spite of those who resisted his will, and in spite of those who doubted his word, friends, King Jesus truly, boldly, and unstoppably rose from the dead. This is what Chuck was talking about as he he referenced the hymn we sang earlier. Nothing, the grave could not hold him. He tore the bars away. He is the Lord. He is the Lord of life. This is wonderful news. The text is written to, to prove to us the reality of his resurrection. But there's more to be gleaned from the text. We said, first of all, consider the king's resurrection. But secondly, I want you to consider the king's instruction. The king's instruction. Does anyone think that, (coughs) excuse me, I was being a bit bit hard uh, or rough on the disciples a few moments ago as I surveyed this last section. I just want you to take a look with me at what the Lord did in his interaction with a couple of his disciples in the same passage. We take up at verse 13. We'll keep reading. Here's what we read here. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. Notice about seven miles from Jerusalem. It's a decent walk. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. These things meaning what? Meaning the cross, meaning the burial, meaning the report of the resurrection. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. 
Then one of them named Cleopas answered, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Jerusalem would have been filled with pilgrims for the, for the festival. How have you missed the news? He said to them, What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some of the women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that he had, they had even seen a vision of angels who said to them that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it, just as the women had said, but him they, they did not see. I, I, I love this. You see, King Jesus appeared to a, a couple of otherwise unknown disciples who had heard the testimony of the women and the apostles, but who had not yet seen the risen Christ. They're returning home, a seven-mile walk home. It's interesting to note the fact that still, after, after three and a half years of following Christ and hearing Him teach, the disciples had still missed the point of why He had come. I mean, from what we can gather here, they were still convinced that the, the purpose was a political one, not a spiritual one. His purpose was to redeem Israel was the language of our text, right? Don't miss it. Verses 18 and following, what do we see there? What of the name Cleopas answered? Are you the only one in Jerusalem who doesn't know these things? What things? And he begins to tell them. What does he say in verse 21? But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had thought he was going to free us from the Romans. Even after his death and now resurrection, some of those who had followed him still didn't understand why he came. Just before his ascension, I mean, days after this, the disciples are still asking similar questions. Remember this, Acts chapter 1, verse 6, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, they're still asking. They, they've still spent time with the risen Lord. They're still confused about why he came. Give us the kingdom now. Make us rulers now. Throw off Rome now. Clearly, they had all completely missed the fact that his purpose for coming was a missional one, not a political one. So you notice here many times Luke records his purpose in his own words in Luke 19 and verse 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. He came with a salvific purpose, a saving purpose. And a lot of their misunderstanding, he went on to instruct them. So let's take up our text again, verse 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Now don't miss the language of correction and instruction here. It's so plain. Jesus began his instruction to these disciples by saying, okay, foolish ones, we need to talk. You who are slow of heart to, what's the language? Believe. You've clearly not understood, therefore you have clearly not believed. Clearly here the issue is not that they had not heard the truth about Christ. He states plainly here, they were slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. 
They knew what the prophets had spoken. They just didn't believe what the prophets had spoken. He said here that the issue was that they had not understood and believed the truth that they had already heard. So what does the Lord do? Chide them some more? Flog them all the way back to Emmaus? <laughs> no. He patiently and methodically reviewed the truths that they should have known but had missed. And for the seven-mile walk home, he just taught them the truth. Here's what the prophets said. Here's what Moses wrote. Here's what the law was pointing to. Here's the purpose of the sacrifices. Here's how it all fits. Here's what it said about Jesus. It's all about Him. Verse 26, beginning at Moses and the prophets, He interpreted them in all the Scriptures, the things concerning Himself. In context, it means that he demonstrated to them from the Old Testament Scriptures the necessity of the incarnation, the necessity of the cross, the necessity of his death, the necessity of his burial, and the necessity of his resurrection and his coming ascension. The Old Testament taught the necessity of all that. You missed it, but it was all there. It was all there. You know, I think it's worth pausing here for a moment to ask ourselves a question. Brethren, how truly attentive are we to the things that have been revealed by God to us? Or how much do we just live on the surface of the word, picking a word or a verse here and there as it suits us, versus studying what God has said and why God has said it and what God intends to communicate so that we actually glorify Him, not merely name His name, while living our lives for ourselves. I listened to his instruction to his own followers, his own disciples, after his death and resurrection, after three and a half years of ministry, after a lifetime that they'd been taught the words of the Old Testament prophets and had missed their meaning. And what does he say? He says, you have had a heart slow to believe all that I had already given you. Let's go through it again. Repeatedly, this passage has shown us how inattentive to and how unbelieving of the things that they had been taught, the things that they were told about the early, the, the, the early scriptures and the, the early reports of the disciples who had already seen things. And in light of the fact that they were so slow to want to believe the truth, I think, friends, we would do well to consider our own attentiveness to and trust in the truth. Do we love the words of our God, all of them? Or do we like it when it's just made easy, right? Keep it simple, stupid, right? We, we like that. We like the kiss principle. Versus let's dive into what God has said and learn what God wants us to know. What's our heart toward the words of God? Now let's keep reading. Verse 28, what do we read here? So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further and they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the, the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. But when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. Earlier in the passage, it had told us in verse 31 that their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And throughout this entire exchange then, Jesus had intentionally kept his disciples in the dark about who he truly was. 
But right here at the end of their conversation, he took the blinders off so that they saw him. They recognized him for who he truly was. What a beautiful picture, right? Just before the cross, what had he done with his disciples? Broken the bread and drunk the, ju- drunk, drunk the wine. What does he do here? He breaks the bread and opens their eyes. Wow, it's, it's just a glorious moment for these disciples. And then he vanished from their sight. I mean, you keep reading the text and see how they respond to this. What do these men do now that they've, they've seen? Well, jump in here, verse 32. They, they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour. And they returned to Jerusalem. According to their testimony to one another, after Jesus departs, these two say to one another that their hearts burned within them as they taught, as he taught them the scriptures. Brothers and sisters, I just have to ask, I, I, I want us to think about this. Is there not something that resonates in the heart of true disciples when the truth of the word and especially the truths about Christ are declared to them? There is something in the soul of a true disciple when they hear the Scriptures truly unfolded that burns within them. Something says, yes, 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 this is true. And I want to ask, do you know that burning of heart? Over the years, as I've sat in counseling rooms, one of my greatest concerns has been when I have begun to describe this to people and said one of my big concerns is sitting in a room, counseling with someone who says, oh yes, yes, I belong to Jesus, and then you read them the word and they just don't have the time of day for it. I know, I know, I've heard this all before. There's no burning of soul that says, yes, this is true. It's just, a, well, okay, whatever. And I have to ask, if there is no burning of soul, are you even His? Are you His? These who were His, As the word was opened and Christ was proclaimed and the beauties and the glories of the gospel through the Old Testament were unfolded to them, their hearts said, yes, this is true. And when their eyes were opened, they rejoiced. And again, like the women at the tomb, they could not keep it to themselves. What had been poured into them had to pour out of them. They had to go tell. Look again, they rose. Verse 33, that same hour they returned to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. I mean, so now they're, 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 they're talking amongst themselves. Hey, Peter's seen Jesus. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Don't miss this. We said this earlier. Emmaus was seven miles from Jerusalem. They had walked all the way home. They they, they were weary physically. They were weary emotionally. They had been disappointed and discouraged by the news of Jesus' death. They had been confused and confounded by the reports of His resurrection. It was now well into the evening. In fact, they pleaded with Jesus, don't. It's getting dark. Don't leave. Just stay for the night. But in spite of all of that, They got up immediately and they walked, maybe even ran, the seven miles back to Jerusalem so that they could tell their brethren the good news that Jesus was alive. What would you have done? What would I have done? Oh, just shoot a text. Uh, we'll tell people tomorrow. It's bedtime. It's been a long day. Their 
their souls were so gripped by what they saw and realized and knew they could not wait another moment. Fourteen miles round trip, 21 if you count the trip home after this. Twenty-one miles so that they could tell someone, he lives. He's alive! You have to know this. You have to know this. You see, friends, there's so much for us to consider, to take from this passage as we wrestle with what was going on in the lives of these saints who were discovering with clarity for the first time, the sovereign is truly sovereign over life and death. And he lives. Every time Christ's followers heard the good news of the resurrection, they went to tell someone about it. When the women received the news from the angels, they ran to tell the apostles what they had been told at the beginning of the text. When the disciples in the village of Emmaus raised, uh, uh, realized that they had been meeting with the risen Christ, they hurried the seven miles back to Jerusalem to tell the others. When they arrived in Jerusalem, they found that the others were already discussing the fact that Peter had come back from his home, apparently, and shared with them all that he had seen the risen Christ. What do we find? Everyone here who learned this news went to tell someone else. They did not keep it to themselves. They declared it once they knew it and believed it for themselves. And I would submit to you, friends, that the pattern of the New Testament is this, the true disciples of Christ are bold witnesses for Christ. True disciples of Christ are bold witnesses for Christ. The third thing I want you to see, and lastly this morning, is this. I want you to see now the king's commission. He commissioned his disciples. Look at the next section of the text, beginning of verse 36. Here's what we read there. As they were talking about these things, okay? So the, the, the two have come back now, and they're with the other disciples, and as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and, and frightened and, and <coughs> excuse me, thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy they, and, and marveling, he said to them, have, any, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and he ate it before them. As the disciples met that night and compared notes and discussed all that they had seen on that very first resurrection day, Jesus came and he appeared to all of them. He stood in their midst and he greeted them. His greeting of peace to you was an appropriate one because the text says they were all scared by his appearance. In fact, Luke tells us that they thought that they saw a ghost. Verse 37. But Jesus quickly dispelled their fears and he proved that he was indeed truly and bodily risen from the grave. He told them that he, he told them to look at him, first of all. He told them to touch him. He told them to give him something to eat and then he ate it right there in front of them. He, he wanted them to know this is no apparition. This is no figment of their collective imagination. This is not some grief-induced, hope-filled memory that's just all coming back at the same moment for all of them. He's alive. He lives. And once he'd established that fact, he went on to teach them all what he had already taught some of them earlier that very same day. In fact, verse 44, what does he say? Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. You can see the Lord was concerned with making sure that his disciples understood the fact that the scriptures were fulfilled in him. 
In fact, he took it all one step further. Keep reading verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the Scriptures. He, he gave them understanding and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in His name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. In these verses, we find Luke, Luke's record of the, the Great Commission. In other words, the, the risen Christ was, was commissioning His disciples to, to go out into the world, to bear witness to the factuality of Christ's suffering and of His resurrection, and to proclaim a message of repentance and forgiveness of sins in Jesus' name. Now friends, that task sounds like an impossible one, and to them, hearing that, it would have been jaw-dropping. Well, uh, we're supposed to reach this whole city. We haven't want to leave this room. Reach the city, and not just the city, all the nations starting here. And notice how he told them there in verse 49 that he would give them all the power that they needed to fulfill the task he had given them to do in the world. It's no wonder in light of all that we've seen in this chapter that Matthew prefaced the commission with these words from Christ. You know this. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority is mine. All power is mine. This is the risen Christ now saying, I am going to give you power to go do this work. Think of it, friends. The risen Christ who had just demonstrated the fact that he had all authority over life and death, now promised to clothe his disciples with power from on high so that they would be equipped to fulfill the mission that he was giving them to fulfill in the world. They weren't being left alone. He was going to give them the fuel to do the very thing he had commissioned them to do. Soon after this, he led them out of the city, he blessed them, he ascended back into heaven, leaving them here on earth with a divinely appointed task to do. In fact, we read in verse 50, then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them, and while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. You know, in light of all that we've seen in this chapter of Luke's Gospel, this final chapter of Luke's Gospel, it should not come as any surprise to us that Luke's follow-up letter, remember what it is? Wrote Luke, he wrote Acts. That Luke's follow-up letter is a record of the way that the apostles obeyed the commission of the Lord and took this good news, this good news of the Gospel, to Jerusalem, to Judea, through Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We find Luke capping off his gospel and then beginning his second letter with this same message and then recording how this was done and how it is to continue to be done through the church. Two weeks ago, I preached a sermon on the importance we place here at TBC on the ministries of evangelism and missions. The Scriptures make plain that as the church, we are God's plan. We are God's plan for reaching the world with the life-giving power of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. As Luke's record has been abundantly clear this morning, friends, Christ's resurrection is what fuels us on our mission. It makes absolutely no, no sense to go out into the world to proclaim a message if we don't believe He lives. What changed in his apostles between their running from the garden 
So they're stepping out in the beginning of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and declaring a message in the same city where their lives were going to be sought, they thought. They thought people were going to try to kill them like they did the Lord. What made them step into those same streets and preach the gospel, and even when threatened with death to say, we ought to obey God rather than men? What changed between the beginning of Luke 24 and a little bit into Luke's second letter, Acts chapter 2? They saw the risen Christ and they received the Holy Spirit of God, that authority, that power He had promised them. And everything changed. Brethren, I say to you this morning, He lives. And if you are in Christ, you have the Spirit of God within you who empowers and emboldens you to be on the task He has called us all to be on. None of us are free to say, well, I'm going to leave it to somebody else to do the very thing God says His resurrection, Christ's resurrection, fuels your obedience in. So on this special Resurrection Day morning, we, we need to have our hearts stirred once again by the truth that our sovereign Lord died in our place. He rose from the grave. He lives again with all authority in heaven and on earth. And on the basis of that authority, He has commissioned us to be about His mission. He's given us a mission in the world to the nations. So by His grace and in His power and for His glory, let us rejoice in the truth of His resurrection. Let us remember the realities of His instruction. And brethren, let us recommit ourselves to fulfilling His commission by His grace. Let's pray. Father, thank You this morning for Your Word. I thank You for Your truth. I ask now that You would send us from here as bold proclaimers of these realities. We thank You for Christ. And we thank You for the opportunity of gathering this morning to celebrate Him. Now would You take us from here? walking boldly in the truth that he lives and declaring this truth to others. For it is in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.